Coming up next on This Week in Computer Hardware, Thunderbolt on Windows. We've got benchmarks, people. AMD's Radeon 7970. Does gigahertz really make a difference? Core i5-3470. Ryan built a PC blindfolded. The best $200 GPU. Google Nexus 7. And a ridiculous but silent GTX 680. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 176, recorded July 5th, 2012. Thunderbolt on Windows. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TWITCH7. And they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm your host, Patrick Norton, and this is the show where we try to bring you the most important news in hardware each and every week. Computer hardware, primarily. CPUs, GPUs, motherboards, power supplies, and I'll be honest with you, we're pretty big on tablets, too. Joining me, as always, Mr. Ryan Shrout, who is still deep in the heart of Texas. How are you, Ryan? Uh, I'm not going to sing the song for you, though. Uh, <laughs> but I, I am here. I'm here one more week. I'm here one more week. Uh, so next week... Chances are I will be back at the regular office, all cool. all things, if they go as planned. And, uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun down here. I did not eat the Migas. I know you were going to ask. Um, I've still got, like, four or five days. It could happen. You're killing uh, me, And man. it's the weekends, so you never know. Now you have to have the Migas just so <laughs> I can hear you go next week. Dude, they were amazing. I would have eaten them every sure. day if only I tried. Actually, that happened to me. I, we found a pizza place, like, right near our uh, place called Double Dave's. And uh, you're, you're we went pizza there like, in Texas two days ago, and I was like, it was great. And they had like dollar pizza rolls, right. and they had all kinds of or uh, pepperoni rolls, something like that. But they were, it was great. And I was like, wow, I wish I'd known this was here three months ago. Oh well. <laughs> Just remember, more barbecue yep. before you go home. Yes. AMD Radeon HD seventy nine seventy three gigabytes. Or the three gigabytes gigahertz gigabytes or gigahertz. The seventy nine seventy gigahertz edition has three yep. gigabytes of memory on it. There you go. Does it do a single delete expletive thing for gaming performance? The extra memory. Uh, well, so no. The, the, well, <laughs> the three gigs is, has always been there, right? So the three right. gigs of memory on the seventy nine seventy is there. It does. It, if we compare it to like the two gigs on the GTX six eighty, there there can be some differences when you start getting into the super high res three panel gaming. Um, for 1080p and maybe even for 2560 by 1600, like your 37 inch or your 27 inch cat leap panels that we were kind of discussing before the show probably won't make that much of a difference. Um, the, the new part here is that it's a gigahertz edition, which I really kind of have a, a thing against that moniker just in general right. because I, I whatever the, the clock speeds don't really matter in the end. We went through this whole thing like eight, right. eight years ago. The, the the point of it is the default 7970 when it first launched uh, late last year was 925 megahertz clock speed. And this one starts at 1,000 megahertz and actually introduces uh, what they are calling a power tune with a boost, which <laughs> might sound familiar to you if uh, you follow the GTX 680 Kepler launch and that kind of stuff. And, it, you know, because the technology works in a very similar way if you have... A uh, thermal headroom, it will clock as high as 1,050 megahertz. Mm. Although, uh, what what was interesting to me, and I had I had these discussions slash arguments with the with the AMD people, was they're very adamant that every Radeon 7970 card performs identically uh, in each user's system, regardless of what other components they have, regardless of what their system configuration is, regardless of what the temperature inside their case is. They were very adamant that that provided the best user experience, that you knew that the card you were going to buy was going to perform at X levels, no matter what other components, you know, I don't want to say components, but what other system environments, you know, you happen to be in. And uh, NVIDIA was kind of on the other side of that. They were like, well, 
some of these GPUs will perform better than other GPUs in certain situations. And there's going to be these small fluctuations uh, from part to part that you actually uh, can can buy. And uh, there's a potential for some people to yeah. get upset if they get the lower end of that compared <laughs> to their friend who may get the upper end of that. But I don't think the variance is very high. Uh, but they're sticking with that with the 7970 gigahertz edition, even though they have boost for every user that plays Metro 2033 on the same CPU memory combination, it will perform the same, right? right. If, if, if one GPU is going to clock up to 1050, every GPU will clock up to 1050. Uh, and, and that's not the case on NVIDIA's options. <laughs> Isn't that called bin sorting? I mean, it's, it's so disingenuous for somebody to be like, you know, all the parts perform exactly the same. Well, it's like if you bin sort them really carefully so that they right. all perform exactly the same, but... That's been one of the running, you know, kind of like one of the biggest open, openly known secrets in, in computing is that, hey, you, 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 you know, people try multiple chips and some of them overclock better than others. And then mm -hmm. you set records with them or then you just happen to overclock better. You know, it's, it's yep. just it's it's funny what people that's, will say. That, that's when exactly that's exactly that's exactly what they do with uh, like their partner overclocked cards. Right. Right. Um, but I, I guess AMD stands and there's some validity to it, I believe that, hey, you know, when we sell a part, you know, we're selling it not just to our partners, but to the to the market as a whole. We believe that if we say 7970, it should perform like a 7970 across right. all these different vendors. Now, what they do with it beyond that and they what their marketing and, and structure is, is, is totally up to them. Um, but, but, you know, and the same thing happens on the CPU side, right? So, Intel makes a 3770K Ivy Bridge processor, and it's going to perform the same across all these different platforms. Mm -hmm. There's there's small fluctuations with Turbo Boost, but they're they're relatively minor. So I think um, what Nvidia has kind of done is 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 let they they may be doing a little bit less uh, restriction on that bidding process, and AMD still has more restrictions with that bidding process. You know, but but the I guess overall. You know, we, we kind of the, the power tune with Boost is a similar idea. It's a little bit more uh, pragmatic. It's a little bit more specific. It doesn't have the same kind of fluctuations. Um, performance wise, what is interesting about this card is that in some cases, actually, I'd say in about half the cases, mm -hmm. the 7970 gigahertz is now faster than the GTX 680. Like they've kind of swapped positions again. AMD kind of has the performance lead. Yeah. Um, especially at the higher resolutions. So like Battlefield 3 at 1080p, the GTX 680 is still a little bit faster, but if you look at 2560 by 1600, uh, the, the 7970 gigahertz edition is actually a little bit faster. Uh, and we see that repeated on, on a quite, quite a few games. So, you know, if you... If you want that bleeding edge performance and you're looking at triple panel stuff, you know, the, the 7970 gigahertz edition may, again, be... Uh, the top performing kind of single GPU option. Obviously, the top performing card is still the GTX 690 with its you know dual Kepler right. GPUs. Um, but there there is a downside to this card, and that is uh, the power consumption. It, we, we were very impressed with Nvidia's Kepler when it came to power consumption. The 7970 gigahertz edition actually uses about 30 watts more than the original 7970. Mm -hmm. So um, the Power consumption increase, or you know, in, in with the frequency increases, is, is definitely visible, right? And if we compare it that way, you're actually looking at a 60 watt difference between the 680 and the 7970 gigahertz edition. So that's actually pretty significant, right? If right. you look at the top NVIDIA card and the top AMD card now, you're seeing a 60 watt power consumption difference um, for cards that are performing very close. Uh, I did very close to the same across a, a large set of games. Should, should I mean when we're talking about desktops, we're talking about you know we, I don't think we've recommended anybody buy anything lower than a 500 watt power supply <laughs> in in recent memory. I mean 60 watts on a 500 watt of 700 watt power supply. I mean what's 60 watts between friends, right? Or are we talking about like 60 watts at idle? No, no, no. We're not, definitely not talking at idle, right? So this is 60 watts under a total load. Uh, I would agree with you to some to to. Uh, a good degree, right? So, right. PC gamers, if you're if you're worried about buying a five hundred dollar video card, you're probably not worried about that sixty watts extra power that's being consumed while you're playing Battlefield Three or whatever game it happens to be. Um, yes, but what it, the, if there are some people who that will be a concern for, mm -hmm. not necessarily for 
cost, but maybe for noise, uh, uh, for heating your bedroom. If you, if you live in a dorm with two guys that have two <laughs> gaming computers, maybe that's a little bit more of a concern. Um, but for, for maybe the average gamer, you're right. This, the 60 watts difference isn't going to be that big. Um, right. I'd say NVIDIA has more, uh, a little bit better feature set implementation with this part of the generation. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting. I would really recommend reading some reviews, obviously the one at, at pcper.com <laughs> and, uh, be first and, and others. List. Right. <laughs> Uh, but you know, get a good idea of like what what benefit, features and benefits there are either way. Uh, but it's but it's interesting to see AMD not kind of sit back and do right. nothing, right? So some people say this is just an overclocked part. It's kind of a sham, but it, pretty much all parts are overclocked parts, right? I mean, yeah. It's something- if they if they can produce it in volume, you think about it this way: we had like you know, it's the six ninety, it's the six eighty, they're amazing. We can't buy them. You know what I mean? If they can ship the part in volume, they can overclock the living, you know delete expletive out of it and i'm fine so i mean at this point it's a thousand nine hundred or a thousand dollars for the 690 the 7970 gigahertz edition 499 the regular hd 7970 three gigabytes 499 449 the mm-hmm. geforce gtx 680 499 and the 670 is coming in around 400 that's pretty much the top five right now yep okay and if your market, if your if power consumption is 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 your your primary consideration, definitely be looking at one of the Nvidia parts. And I yeah. got to say, I hadn't thought about you know heat on a computer for a while until I I finally got our server moved into the, the front hall closet, and right. you know it'll be like you know sixty degrees in the in the front bedroom, and it'll open up the hall closet, and the waves of heat will come out, and it's like wow, I don't even have a GPU in this machine. It's just the you know it's just a Core i five and a motherboard, and I'm like. There's just a lot of heat when that thing's doing not much of anything. Right. Oh, my goodness. Summer and heat is fun. So is the Intel Core i5-3470 Ivy Ridge processor uh, with the HD2500 graphics. So it's it's just a little bit less expensive. What's the performance like on the uh, so this, 3470? This is, this is a Core i5 part. So it's quad-core Ivy Bridge, no hyper-threading. It gives you a pretty good idea of what the performance is going to be. It obviously right. depends on your application. You know, if you're single, double four threaded application uh this is going to perform very very well and in some cases like if you look at um uh, what are some of the tests that might show that if you look at the uh, rendering and scientific results i believe if you look at yeah euler 3d which is kind of like a fluid dynamics benchmark um the Core i5-3470 actually outperforms the Core i7-3770 which is the top end ivy bridge uh at four threads because the four threads bounce between cores and hyper-threaded cores right. uh, on, the, on, the, on the highest end skew, whereas they're only on primary cores on the 3470. So, um, you know, it has a little bit of advantage that the operating system, operating system doesn't have to worry about balancing uh, where those four threads are, making sure that they're, at, you know, where they need to get the best performance. There's only these four cores. Uh, and hyper-threading obviously isn't nearly as efficient as... Uh, uh, just raw cores are. So um, once you go above four threads, obviously the 3770 is going to, is going to dominate in those levels, but it's, so in performance, I think most people would be really, really happy with the 3470 in terms of its computing performance, right? You know, Mm -hmm. it's it's, it's four, four, four cores is going to be enough for most people. Um, The kind of downside is, is that's not, a K series part. It's not an unlocked processor, meaning that your overclocking is somewhat limited. Uh, you you can't just kind of turn up the multiplier and see how high it goes like you right. can on the on the other Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge K series parts. You know, we were I was able to hit four gigahertz on all four cores, which is um, like an eight hundred megahertz increase, which is good. But we were able to hit four point five and four point six on the other Ivy Bridge parts, the unlocked parts. Um, and this is basically a limit of the fact that we couldn't go higher than the multipliers that we were provided uh, by, by this chip. So that's, that's one of the downsides to it. It's, um, you know, also on that, on that same page as the overclocking, you'll see some benchmark uh, or some power consumption numbers that mm-hmm. are really impressive. This Core i5-3470 system, and keep in mind that it has a GeForce GTX 560 Ti. If you look at the load power consumption, the next graph down, right. it's 100.1 watts under full processor load. Wow. So, the, and this is, this is a really, really powerful system, right? And we saw, I mean, you could look at the Sandy Bridge 
143. That's a quad core hyper threaded. Then you see the 3770K at 117 watts. That's a big decrease. And we're going even, you know, 17 watts less than that with this part. It's, it's, it's really impressive to see how much power you can get out of an incredibly low, uh, power consumption envelope. It kind of goes back to our discussion, right? Of the, uh, uh, the 680 versus the 7970 is, does that really matter? I would say not in the majority of cases, but in some select cases, it really can. And then when you start saying, you know, breaking that 100 watt barrier and again, using a discrete graphics card in the system, um, that's pretty nice. Well, I mean, this is also, you know, and as as much as I I might mock 60 watts in in the context of a typical home, right? Because, you know, you think like it's 60 watts, that's that's a lot of electricity. Then you figure, you know, if you're paying like nine cents a a kilowatt, all of a sudden, you know, the numbers don't look as impressive. Right. If, If you're... A company that's got a thousand workstations and you're cutting your power consumption in half, that's a big deal in terms of cost. If you're running a you know server farm and you're cutting your power consumption and your heat consumption in a considerable manner, that's a huge gain. All of a sudden, you're spending a lot less money on, on AC or you can cram a lot more boxes uh, in the same amount of space. So I got I to gotta admit, Intel's doing some really, really impressive stuff these days. Should we take a moment to talk about what's going on with uh, the sort of, you know, the, the title of the article, AMD, Vashira, and beyond, new design philosophy dictates a faster place. I mean, what's going on at AMD right now? Because we've already mentioned it previously on the show that AMD is kind of like, we're, we can't compete with Intel on raw performance on the chips. We're going to go right. for sort of inexpensive, mass market, middle of the sweet spot uh, CPUs. We've got the better GPU integration because because we do graphics better than Intel. But what what's going on in terms of larger changes over time over at AMD? So this this is editorial that uh, Josh wrote for mm-hmm. us over at uh, PC Perspective, and it's a really good look at kind of where he thinks the AMD design philosophy is taking them. And it's not strictly you know a lot of people are are, are on the bandwagon. I'll, I'll admit I was one of them as well. It's like oh they're just they're going to they're going to be an arm design house soon right and he's saying that's not necessarily the case um you know there there's a reason why cray supercomputers is still selecting the amd bulldozer architecture for some of their supercomputers right there 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 are benefits and and to the design that amd has gone with um he he talks a lot about the editorial uh for the uh Vichera, which is the upcoming uh discrete I don't want to say discrete. It's a, it, a non APU. It's just a, uh, just a CPU, right? There's no integrated graphics on this part. And he's saying that he, from what he's hearing, we're seeing eight to ten percent increases in IPC, which is you know performance per clock, instructions per clock, and that we expect these clock speeds to run higher as well. Some somewhere in the three point eight, maybe as high as four gigahertz mark by default. And if that's the case. Uh, these these processors coming later in, in this year, Q3 or Q4, um, could actually put the the lipstick on the proverbial pig of bulldozer. <laughs> right? We we might actually say, okay, this is actually pile driver, and it's not just pile driver; it's pile right. driver with a little bit more added onto it as well. And maybe we've figured out the process, and we're able to get clock speeds to a place where we are comfortable with. And do I think they're gonna, you know, be able to really, really? just nail in, uh, in Intel to the wall with something like this? No, right. I, don't, I don't think that's going to be the case because I still think Intel has tons of headroom that they're just holding back on anyway. Um, there's a reason the highest in Ivy Bridge part is a 77-watt part. If they wanted to make a 120-watt part, they could clock that sucker really high. Uh, but it, AMD doesn't have to win to be useful. They just need to be competitive, right? So... Um, it will be interesting to see kind of how this works out. There's a lot of details in the article in terms of um, about Vichera. If you've never heard about this part, it's a 32 nanometer pile driver based uh, processor. There's a little bit of information there on the next generation APU that will be based on this uh, and how that kind of uh, measures out. But if you're, if you're curious about what AMD's, stances are going to be and their chances of going into the end of 2012 and 2013 it's definitely worth a read very good uh something people should be paying attention on we've we've been it, it started as light peak light peak a few years ago in intel technology it was going to be like you know better than usb better than 1394 better than uh e uh it morphed into thunderbolt 
uh, using copper, a modified USB connection um, instead of fiber optic. It showed up basically Thunderbolt, of course, being the Macintosh name for it. Well, actually, it turns out to be the name for it. Thunderbolt yep. showing up uh, on PCs. Gigabyte this week launched the first dual Thunderbolt motherboard. Which basically yep. means, you know, bidirectional 10 gigabit per second data pipeline uh, can do PCI Express. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> uh, go one more article down. There should be an article for Gigabyte on that one. The because uh, that was the picture of the one of the original Intel mockups you saw for oh, Thunderbolt. Right. right. Um, so basically, with two Thunderbolt ports, you can actually power up to 12 devices uh, and two uh, displays simultaneously. So Gigabyte's launched the first, the world's first fully certified dual port Thunderbolt motherboards, and you've been spending a lot of quality time with motherboards from Asus and I want to say MSI. Okay, MSI. So it's like it can't be Gigabyte because Gigabyte just started to get rolling. How do you right. like it so far? How's the benchmarking been? You know, I have to say I, I came away more impressed than I thought I was going to be with mm -hmm. my overall Thunderbolt experience. I spent a lot of time kind of playing with it and making sure that things worked the way that they were supposed to work mm -hmm. um, before really wanting to write it. And and the, the first motherboard we used was actually the Asus uh, P8Z77V Premium. Um, and uh, th this this board is was kind of like the first to get officially certified, and it had the you know the best implementation of it and all that kind of stuff. So we we wanted to use that one first just to get a good idea of a baseline for what to expect from Thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. And uh, overall, I've been pretty impressed. So you know what was what's interesting to me about Thunderbolt is that keep in mind it is an extension of PCI Express. So all the stuff that that I was able to test today, you know, is basically external storage right. and a monitor. But the 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 premise for Thunderbolt is much, much greater than that, right? We've seen uh, at CES, we saw external graphics card docks. Uh, we've seen external extensions of systems um, for installing multiple controller cards. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of things that can happen, connecting two PCs directly over you know, this 10 gigabit per second connection. Um, th these are all ideas that, that will happen. But today, like the primary focus of Thunderbolt is docks, Hard monitors, drives, external hard, hard drives, drives, external hard drives, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, our first testing, we actually uh, got in a, a Pegasus R4, which is a four drive um, SATA 6 uh, external storage unit, essentially. What's really cool is when you when you plug it in. Now, what's interesting, you don't have to have a there's no drivers for the Thunderbolt controller. It just works because it, it kind of becomes an extension of the PCI Express bus. If you look on that on the first page of that article and you go all the way down, you see this really interesting looking like branching of all these PCI uh, standard PCI to PCI bridges. Right. right? This kind of shows you what everything looks like as it's uh, as it's all connected and that kind of stuff. Um but it's it, you don't need drivers for that, but you may need drivers for devices because essentially by plugging in a Thunderbolt device, you are essentially telling uh, the system that it's it's plugged in as if it were plugged mm -hmm. into a PCI Express slot. So <laughs> when we plugged in this Pegasus R4, you know it shows up as a as a RAID controller, and when you install the driver for it, it shows up as a SATA 6G RAID controller as if it were you know installed in your system. So it shows up uh, in your computer management in terms of how it shows up as a storage device. Mm -hmm. It shows up just as a drive letter. It shows up as an internal drive as opposed to an external drive that connected by any kind of network or anything like that, which is which is really nice. Uh, just in terms of software compatibility for certain things, you know. The long story short, the performance I was out of a single drive. Uh, or I'm sorry, I have a single unit using four 7200 RPM hard drives. We were able to hit like, I think, 700 megabytes per second. Wow. And then when I swapped those out for four SSDs, just to try to squeeze the most out of it possible, I think we got like 920 megabytes per second read capability out of it, which is really good, right? It's not, the theoretical peak is 1.25 gigabytes, but right. once you take overhead and everything like that, you're, you're looking at, you know, about one gigabyte per second as your maximum. So we're getting pretty close to that. And for the first implementation on the first pieces of hardware that have really been available, uh, that, that, that's actually pretty good. I also, get and that's my with hands a on. monitor running in the background also. Or? Yeah. So what's interesting is that's the amazing. Monitor, monitor has no effect on the bandwidth at all. That's really cool. It runs on different channels inside the connection. So remember, Thunderbolt, a Thunderbolt cable will transmit uh, PCI Express data and then at, on a separate kind of plane, DisplayPort data. So DisplayPort connection 
works just like a DisplayPort monitor in any other way, uh, but it doesn't affect the data connection at all. So we actually had several, we actually had two of the R4 units and a monitor hooked up and we had no issues. And uh, we were using the, the Apple Thunderbolt display and it has cool stuff on it like uh, in- integrated speakers, gigabit ethernet, Mm-hmm. Uh, a camera, FireWire, <laughs> USB, that kind of stuff on the back of it. Now, we don't have Windows drivers for a lot of that stuff yet, but the integrated sound was working, and we were able to, you know, we were listening to music, playing a game while doing the 910 megabytes per second transfer rates, uh, and we really didn't have any issues at all. Uh, and once we had the drivers installed and everything set up, you know, uh, it was it was hot plug, almost as easy as USB. I think mm-hmm. maybe one or two times we had to reboot the machine for it to recognize it. Um, you know, and that was when we had like a couple of them daisy chained right. type of deal. Uh, but you, I, I was really impressed with the whole experience. Actually, did you do any? Did you do any sort of comparison between USB 3.0 performance versus Thunderbolt performance? Not not directly. Uh-huh. Um, and and the reason I would say that is. If you're if you want to if you have a single drive right. SSD or hard drive that you need for external storage, if you have Thunderbolt on your system, you can use it. But USB 3.0 is going to be fine because USB 3.0 maxes out at five gigabits per second. The current generation of Thunderbolt does ten gigabits. Right. You're really only going to take advantage of that amount of bandwidth that you have with Thunderbolt if you. You know, you have like these professional level devices. If you have this big external RAID array, that type of thing. Um, I know Seagate is selling a Thunderbolt adapter for mm-hmm. like uh, two and a half inch hard drives, um, which which it works. Uh, we've tested one, but you know, you're kind of maxed out at like the 300 to 350 megabytes per second with, with regardless of what SSD you're going to use, maybe up as high as four, but it's about the same performance as USB 3.0 because the bottleneck is actually the drive. It's not actually the connection. <laughs> right. So in order to, I mean, that's why it seems crazy. We had four SATA 6G SSDs and a RAID 0 array on this external unit just to try <laughs> to push as much bandwidth as we could. It's expensive for a consumer product. Um, it's it's right. maybe not as useful yet because there's not a whole lot of devices to take advantage of it. Um, but I think that the the idea is professionals will get this in their hands. They'll right. see how it will be uh, useful. It will come down in price and we will see implementations for consumers of pretty much all price ranges. Are there any hints at this point that the cable costs are going to come down? Because right now there are basically $50 cables. Some of them are right. two meters long. Some of them are six meters long. They all basically, it's amazing because it's cable that has a whole bunch of chips at one end of it. I right. want to say 12 both or ends, at both, both ends, 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 pardon me, I mean, which what's, is part of what gives us this amazing performance and the ability to sort of, of, of do all this, this uh, uh, broadband right. in the purest sense of the lots of signals on a, uh, on, on the same copper kind of thing. But 50 bucks for a cable is expensive. You're, you know, you buy a hard drive, there's no Thunderbolt cable in the box right. um, because, you know, right. Seagate doesn't want to doesn't want to eat that that gigantic cost or make their one terabyte drive suddenly look ridiculously expensive. Intel has said that the the prices on these cables are going to come down. Right. Um, uh, we I think we've seen <laughs> one cable, but it's also been forty nine dollars. Right. Uh, we we There's basically Apple down. and two other cables you can buy on the internet. And they're right. all like you know forty nine or fifty dollars. It's um, funny is the cape the end of the cable with that logic in it actually gets warm to the touch <laughs> while you're using it as well right. because of the logic in there. It's responsible for kind of separating the Display Port and um, uh, PCI Express data on the fly type of thing. Um, but yeah, fifty dollars cables aren't what we need for this to work. Right? We we need smarter 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 versions of this in the in yes. the twenty or thirty range for sure. Ten. <laughs> okay, we'll $10 do that. Range. Set, let's set the right goals. Ten, ten dollars Intel. We should take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. Squarespace is bringing the show to you today. Ryan, could you tell us a little bit more about them? I would love to, Patrick. I would love nothing more. This episode <laughs> is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. Space, Squarespace.com has a lot of great features that uh, even if you're a first-time website builder or an experienced website builder, uh, that you're really going to love to take advantage of. They have an uh, easy-to-use user interface for creating and managing that website or blog. Um, free domain registration for annual plan customers. That's actually a, a, a good deal. Domain selection and mapping is completely integrated with the sign-up process. So if, uh, if you're a, a newbie to the world of building a website and registering a domain and doing something, they'll, they'll handle all of that kind of stuff for you. Um, as I said, it's optimized for both beginners and experts, right? So uh, if you want to get into the nitty-gritty CSS coding side of things, you can absolutely do that. They give you all the tools for that. Uh, you don't 
I don't know if you, I, you have the capability to, to download a CSS file, edit it in your editor and upload it, or you can edit it on, on online as well as you go kind of on the fly. Uh, but if you're not into that, they have tons of templates uh, and you can start with one. You can do modifications. You can easily kind of like drag and drop these features and segments around uh, and to really customize it to your you know, your content, right? You, you can do a little bit, you can do a lot. You can, you, you could, you can load up a website and have it registered and, and started running in, in, in five minutes if you want to, or if you want to spend a couple of days and make sure it's something perfect, you can absolutely do that. Uh, they have uh, free live webinar classes to help you get the most out of your Squarespace uh, site or blog. It is an all-inclusive service, which means it includes um, uh, modules to build your website, like the blog module, the form builder, uh, Flickr photo displays, Twitter widgets, social media buttons to connect to Facebook and Twitter, Google Maps, all that kind of stuff. It also has website tracking, so you know how many times your site is viewed. It has a search engine optimizer. Uh, it has permission access handling, so if you have multiple users that uh, you want to, to kind of post to your site, you can control what things they can and can't do, right? Which is, which is a good idea. And, and as importantly, it's built on a cloud architecture, which means that it's, uh, it's architected for site stability and speed, right? You don't have to worry about uh, getting a whole bunch of traffic and your site going down. You don't have to worry about losing a hard drive on a server and everything's lost, right? They do a good job of keeping all that, maintaining everything, and making sure the site is ready for any kind of traffic that it might get. Um, you should definitely check out Squarespace for all of your website needs. You use them to build it, to host it, update it at any time. For a free trial, this is great. For a free trial, all you have to do is go to squarespace.com. No specific URL. Just go to squarespace.com, sign up for a free account. You don't need a credit card. You just try it out, start building your website right away. If you decide to purchase it, you can use offer code TWITCH7, that's T-W-I-C-H-7, and you can get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. Uh, don't forget about free domain registration uh, with annual plan subscription. So if you want to get the most value out of it, you know, sign up for the free account, see how much you love the service, use that offer code T-W-I-C-H-7, Twitch7, and uh, get 10% off and your free domain as well. That's squarespace.com, offer code Twitch7, and we thank Squarespace for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Thank you, Squarespace. So... We teased about this, uh, and I apologize to everybody who's a regular listener. We did not have a show last week due to what I will affectionately call scheduling difficulties that involved <laughs> both Ryan and I traveling at the speed of light without the benefit of transporter. Wow. Yeah, I, I exaggerate slightly there. A bit yeah. of the hyperbole. Um, but you did, in fact, build a PC while blindfolded. I did. Um, did you have to I put the so. little screws in the motherboard? That was the part I that did. I couldn't figure out a way to do. I did. Uh, and it, that took a long time. And I tell you what, <laughs> I ended up giving up at only doing three of the six or eight that were there. I was just like, ah, screw it. I'm tired of this. I'm moving on. Um, it was it was a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. I built a, an AMD Lano based uh -huh. APU system. Uh, and yeah, you can see a little screenshot of me with my scarf wrapped around my face. Uh, <laughs> it also got very hot underneath that scarf. I, I bet will, it did. I um, so I vastly underestimated the amount of time it was going to take me to build this system. It was fun to do, but uh, I think I, I think my last guess was probably like in the thirty to forty minute range. And uh, Ken, yeah, look at that. This is like this is just like opening stuff up, and I started knocking stuff <laughs> off the table. And it was, it was so it normally might take you ten, maybe twenty minutes. Uh, right. Probably ten minutes if the if the motherboard screwed into the case, you know, maybe right. twenty minutes on the outside if you stop for a cup of coffee to build a PC. Normally, blindfolded, it took you an hour and eighteen minutes. Wow! And that obviously I didn't have to do the OS install. We already had Ken had already set everything up and made sure that it all run. Uh -huh. It had all it all ran okay, and it had an OS installed on the on the hard drive and that kind of stuff. Uh, the most difficult parts: um, <laughs> spreading the thermal paste. <laughs> uh, which I could hear, I could hear Ken laughing at me while I was doing it, and uh, when I watched the video playback, I was like, "Wow, that was really awful." Yeah, you can see this. Like, I, I think I have it on there, and, and you're squeezing it out, right? And you don't want to get it on your hands. Um, and and I actually do get it on the processor. But then I try to I try to like what you're supposed to do. You take a little business card and you smooth it out on the top of it. And I thought I had did a good job, but Kim was laughing at me the whole time, and I knew something was going amiss. So you can see, I actually I put it like right on the edge <laughs> of the processor. Is it's not the best practice uh, to be 
to be perfectly honest. It's, it was, it was fun. It, it was, it was a, it was an interesting Saturday project. We'll put it that way. <laughs> if you haven't seen the video, uh, go to pcpro.com, just search for blindfolded and it will <laughs> hopefully be the first result that comes up because otherwise I don't know what else we're doing. So yeah. Oh my goodness. So uh, Google I.O. was last week. Uh, we'll just do yeah. a, a brief mention. The two biggest pieces of hardware that people in the Twitch audience are probably curious about, the uh, Nexus 7 tablet, which I had my grubby little paws on. Uh, it's interesting because the they're they're using a multi-core processor it's a very fast tablet um but a lot of what you're feeling with the speed of the tablet has less to do with the actual processor in the tablet than butter which is part of <laughs> jelly bean which uh our, i did an interview with our cto rob DeMillo, and rob was like this should not be a point one update this should be like a a, a go not four to four point one this should be four point one to five this should be a five point oh update this is a big update they did a lot with it but Butter does some interesting things in how threads are handled uh, and prioritizing uh, the graphics uh, uh, handling inside the device. Basically, the, the the application in front of you gets prioritized instead of just sort of sitting there in your queue with everything else. Um, so the, the the Nexus 7 looks like a gorgeous tablet. It feels good in the hand. The display is, is very nice. A little more confusing is the Nexus Q, which... Um, yeah, I don't... I heard, you know, we didn't talk about this on, on Techzilla when we were talking about it because it, it's kind of funny because it, it's, an, it's an orb. It's a ball. It looks, it's about looks the size cool. of an orb speaker. So it's got a full, like, audiophile grade amplifier built in it with these massive jacks, mm -hmm. like banana jacks on the back of yep. it. It's essentially a, a, a fully functional jelly bean uh uh, Android 4.1 device. It's got HDMI. Okay. It's got Ethernet. And it's got a spinny top. And and I thought it was supposed to come off, and and Demille, uh, I thought he was going to kill me because I <laughs> did you break he, it? Well, no, he, I didn't break it. I dropped it at one point. It's heavy. The thing weighs about four pounds because of the power supply, um, <laughs> or nine pounds. It's heavy. It's a, I wouldn't want to be hit in the head with one. It would be uh, gotcha. <laughs> Colonel Ryan in the kitchen with the <laughs> Nexus Q um, to make a clue reference. But the, the thing that's, that people are postulating after Google I.O. is that it's actually Google's attempt not so much to put a media device or a set-top box, because essentially that is a set-top box. It's, it's a set-top box. It's a Sonos competitor. It only works with Google Play. There's, there's no third-party video uh, services on there. But they think it may be what they want people to use to bring Android gaming and Android applications onto their HDTVs. Um, but it's heavy. It's like it's heavy. It's like it's expensive. It's like four hundred bucks. Um, to me, three hundred bucks. <laughs> For some reason, I thought it was four hundred. Possibly because it's so heavy. Uh, it's an interesting device. I'm really curious to see what the sales on that are going to be like. And I'm really curious to see if they're going to open up the ecosystem on that or just kind of keep it very Google Play centric. Because Google, right. Google is very much trying to. Because the Nexus Seven. The amazing thing about the Nexus Seven is it's fast and it's like two hundred bucks. It is ridiculously cheap for what you're getting, and it's certainly a shot across the bow at Amazon because at this point, it's less about the hardware for Google than it is about competing with the iTunes ecosystem and the Amazon ecosystem for controlling the pipeline of content to your face, right. uh, which seems to be where the majority of the money is coming from. So we... I Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't want to talk about that, that this particular device too much. I, I thought it was interesting. I don't know. It's a, it's, it goes, my interest in it was a replacement for Sonos, a replacement for AirPlay, like those types of things in terms of the media stuff exact, precisely, you know, it's like, eh, okay, that's pretty cool. But 300 bucks is a lot, is a lot to swallow for yeah. uh, that kind of device. I think it may be one of those things where it ends up with this really dense core of enthusiasts who love it because it's this, you know, this amazing amplifier and they can send audio to it. Well, they um, mentioned hackability in the presentation, right? Like, <laughs> and they got a huge round of applause. Right. So, you know, they, 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 I think they, they're going at that audience that's, for sure. Well, you know, that's a big part There's of the intelligence Android there as long as you can hit both sides, right? You know, you make. <laughs> You can't ignore right. the mainstream. Otherwise, you make a product that's not going to be successful. Well, and, and even Apple, who's been so successful with so many devices, still considers the Apple TV a hobby. And the Apple TV mm -hmm. is a $100 device that works fairly flawlessly. Yep. Um, Windows 8, they've announced the cost for that, or at least the upgrade cost, $39 for the upgrade. Um, for Is that for the Windows 8 Pro upgrade is going to be $39, yeah. which is important for me and for, for my buddy Robert Heron on HD Nation because, of course, 
It means you get Windows Media Center because you need Pro to get Media Center, which kind of sucks, but I don't want to get cranky about that. <laughs> Dell is building Ubuntu Notebooks if you've been looking for a pre-built system. I've had my hands on Dell's XPS 13 Ultrabook, uh, and oh, yeah. they just also released 14 and 15-inch editions of the Dell uh, Notebooks, the XPS Notebooks. They feel fantastic. Uh, they are obviously very sort of influenced design-wise by uh, the MacBook Pros. Um, but if you, you know, Dell recently announced it's turning on an open source Linux OS to craft a developer focused operating system enabled by Dell's incubation program and accompanying monetary funding. The pilot program named Project Sputnik is based on Dell's XPS 13 Ultrabook and Ubuntu 12.04 LTS OS. So it's going to run for six months and they're trying to figure out sort of an ideal software hardware balance for developers. Um, and so if you're kind of into getting your Linux on, take a look at what's going on over at Dell. And you have the most redonkulous, and I hate using that word in public. Uh, <laughs> As you should. I, I, I would like to apologize to the to the listening audience, uh, especially all the people who just uh, canceled their subscription to the show. <laughs> uh, it's an NVIDIA GTX packed in a in what looks like. I don't even know how to describe this. Just just put it up on screen, Burke. Get it up there. It's huge. It is a passively cooled NVIDIA GTX 680. And while we may talk about how much more thermally efficient or power efficient the GTX, the mm -hmm. NVIDIA chips are compared to the AMD chips, you get an idea of just exactly how much heat you're still having to radiate when you look at this. Like, Is this like a nine PCI Express slot wide <laughs> GPU? <laughs> See that little slip in the middle? That's the GPU. And everything right. else... I don't. I don't it's even cooler. know. Does it say? Let's see. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, this is this is what's interesting to me. So the company that's making this is called Colorful, right? And I tried to look up some information on Colorful as a company. I was like, All right, let's get in touch with these guys, see if they actually want to send us one to test. And it was, let's say, difficult. It's a <laughs> Korean, Japanese, Chinese company that doesn't have really English website type stuff uh but they you know sent out this little pr about this passively cool gtx 680 now keep in mind that this cooler in theory has to be rated at being able to passively cool 250 watts that's 220 a, watts so there's I mean, th there's two massive if you scroll down a little bit you see there's there's two massive heat sinks um there it is. So that's one half of, of the cooling device. There's three heat pipes on that. You flip it over. There's like three heat pipes on the other side, apparently. Yeah. This thing is at the top with six with a six heat pipe uh, connection. I'm, I'm guessing four slots for this thing, it looks like, because it's, it's got at, at least. At least. At least. And what's interesting is, is because so much of it is behind the GPU, you have to have <laughs> like... You may not be able to put this in your primary PCI Express slot. It may have to go right. in your secondary PCI Express slot because of how much, you know, depending on your motherboard design, how close you are to the, the processor itself. So no shipping information, no purchasing information. No, but if you that. want top line yeah. GPU performance and want no noise, this I, is certainly I an just, option. <laughs> I just, I just need to be proved that it works. Like I don't, like I, yeah. I need to put it in a system and loop Metro twenty thirty three for like six hours and see what parts of it melt because yeah. I just, I don't know. I, you, you are, God. are you, you are skeptical at the possibility of dissipating the better part of three hundred watts without the use of fans. Right, that and is it a seems reasonable. To like if you have to, if you have to have a lot of case fans to move air across it, it kind of defeats the purpose. Right. So you know, I'm gonna. <laughs> I, I tell you what, if they send me one, I'm gonna try to build a completely silent, fanless PC with it. I'll use that as the GPU, and I'll use that would like, be cool. I don't that know what CPU. Really cool. I have to find like the biggest heatsink I can for CPUs as well. But I don't. <laughs> and then you can build a giant case for it, and then you can water cool it or fill it with floor inert. Twitch, T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv is our email address. We love your questions. We're going to answer a couple of them in a second. Uh, we want to... To, to Well, we want to ask you to do us a favor. If you enjoy the show, do us a favor. Tell your friends about it. Email a link to it. Best link you can use as far as we're concerned is twit.tv slash twitch. Twit.tv slash twitch is where you can subscribe to the show if you haven't done that already. So please come check that out. We love it when you subscribe through any device because uh, we want cool. you here to join us every week. And uh, twitch at twit.tv is the email address. Our first question comes from Adam. 
Hello, Twitch crew. With all the great graphics cards out there, I'm getting an itch to upgrade. My current setup is two ATI AMD 5870 cards in a Crossfire configuration and a 24-inch Dell UltraShop monitor running at 1920 by 1200. I do not plan on upgrading the monitor to a larger resolution anytime soon, but I am having problems picking a good value card with great performance at that resolution. The NVIDIA 670 is at the high end of my budget and would be a great option, as would the AMD 7800 series, especially with their prices. The other option is to stay with my current setup until the next generation is on the market. I play uh, first-person shooters like Modern Warfare 3, Battlefield, Battle of Honor, and we'll be playing Far Cry 3 when it comes out later in the year. What should I do? Thanks, Adam. The 670 is the high end of the budget. Um, so the fifth, a pair of 5870s is still right. a pretty good configuration for a 19 by 12 um, set of hardware. Um, so he's saying to the next generation of the market, the next generation of GPUs, when will that be? I don't know. Uh, I would say you're, you're probably leaning towards um, maybe late 2012 to see like a new super high end part. Right. But I wouldn't expect to see anything else in the lower end stuff than what we have today. So with that being the case, um, you know, I, I think if – if you have the itch to upgrade, that now is a great time because there's 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 tons of great products out there. What I would like to see still that does not really exist is the sub four hundred dollar Nvidia options. Like I, I I'm really eager to see what the six sixty card is going to be like from from Nvidia. If they're going to have a six sixty Ti, if they'll have a standard one, you know, the, the six seventy at three hundred ninety nine dollars is a, is a great card. Uh, it really is. And so is the 7950 and the 7970, which you can get close to those prices too. But I, I know in my, in my gut that the, what people are really waiting for is that new $199 card or the right. new $250 card that's really going to, you know, from NVIDIA, it's really going to push things. The 7800 cards are in that range. And they're, they're, while they're great options, you still want to know what both um, vendors are going to do maybe before you make that final decision. Uh -huh. um, so I, I, don't, I don't see any uh, harm in maybe waiting a little bit longer. Either right, so yeah. Far Cry Three when it comes out uh, later in the year, um, but but if you if you're looking at it you're like wow I want to play <laughs> Battlefield Three now, yeah. then if the if you can afford a six seventy go that route. If you can uh, if you want to go seventy nine fifty or seventy nine seventy, you know those look at those prices because you can get a seventy nine seventy for. Four twenty nine now I think right. four nineteen uh, those have, those have come down quite a bit. I mean, if he's currently playing, he's, he's currently playing Modern Warfare Three, Battlefield, Medal of Honor. I would almost say, as much as you want to buy a GPU now, wait until Far Cry Three comes out and see if it saves yeah. you the cost of a copy of Far Cry Three when you buy the GPU. Because it's funny, that's true. The closer you get to Christmas, the more off the cliff the prices uh, on 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 the cards are going to go. Um, especially if they release a new high end card out around <laughs> that. All of a sudden, everything that was you know four hundred dollars is three fifty, three fifty is three hundred, three hundred is closing. You know, it's just the longer you wait, the less money you'll spend, mm -hmm. or you'll buy an even faster processor and spend even more. <laughs> Which brings us to Josh. He says, "Hi guys, I love the podcast and listen to new." Every new episode when it arrives. Thank you, Josh. My question is regarding upgrading my ancient Radeon HD 4830 that currently lives in my gaming machine. What card would you recommend for $200 playing today's games and maxed out settings? My current rig is a Core i7 920 overclocked at 3.9 gigahertz with 6 gigs of DDR3 RAM. Thanks for the advice. Keep up the good work, Josh. Thank you, Josh. It's kind of funny. You were just mentioning we're kind of waiting quietly. Right. For the, the new $200 sort of sweet spot. This is kind of the, the classic, serious, you know, affordable gaming card price is going to be around $200. Do we expect it anytime soon? I, it's hard to say. Like, I would think we would have to. I, I honestly don't know when it will be. So, um, you know, the, the best card in that, in that kind of $200 price range now is probably going to be your uh, the 7850. Uh -huh. So if you look at the Radeon HD 7850, you can get those for two twenty nine uh, with with the rebates, so right. as low as two oh nine with rebates. So that's a little bit over his hundred ninety nine dollar price range. Um, but the to be honest with you, the drop from seventy eight fifty to seventy seven seventy is really dramatic in terms right. of performance. Um, so I would definitely say suck it up and buy the seventy eight fifty if you're going to go down that route. Um, because I mean, the, and the price drop goes from two thirty nine to one twenty nine, right. right? So I mean, that's 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 way too big. Um, I, I would say, 
I mean, it's got to be sometime this summer. I mean, it, it has to be sometime this summer that we'll see NVIDIA's lower than than 670 products in the Kepler family, right? Uh, right. It's just it's, it's, it's really interesting to see because – so keep in mind, Kepler is built on GK104. That's the chip it's built on. Uh, the GK107, which is the next one down in terms of performance – is is in the GT six forty? I think is what it was. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago, and it's a dog, and it's just it's just a bad part. It just so they're going to have to take GK one hundred and four, cut off some more of those SMX units, right? right. And make it a little bit lower cost, and go down that route. So you know, I, I have a feeling that it will be maybe by the end of the summer. Um, but it, it, like I'm <laughs> saying, if you if you make that decision to buy seventy eight fifty today, it's 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 not going to be a bad product. It depends on how easily you get buyer's remorse. And if you have it easily, wait until later this summer, yeah. <laughs> which is just a painful thing to say. How about an affordable, reliable South State Drive for Ty? I'm kind of jealous of Ty's son. Ty writes in, hey, guys, let me say that I love the podcast. And you guys really helped me stay awake and pass the time on my 3 to 11 shift at FedEx. Glad we can help. <laughs> Anyway, my question is about SSDs. I have an 8 gigabyte Intel SSD right now, and I want one that's a little bigger, say 128 gigabytes, and then I can pass down the Intel to my son's rig that I just built. Lucky child. I don't trust OCZ as a system drive. I've heard too many bad things, and I'm not sure about Corsair either. I was thinking Samsung's 830, but I've seen the crucial SSDs for a little less money. Which would you recommend? Thanks in advance. And Patrick, I just wanted to say that I still miss the screensavers. Well, so do I. <laughs> Sincerely, Ty in Phillipsburg, New Jersey. Uh, Samsung 830, great value so far. Mm -hmm. uh, reliability has been excellent. I I think you can probably trust the OCC or the Corsair. Um, there have been issues with OCZ, but everybody at one point or another in the SSD world seems to have had issues. It was it was more an issue with with a Sandforce controller and firmware. Right. And it, the thing is, OCZ just sold more of those controller based <laughs> drives than anybody else. Right. Um, so that kind of the, you know. It's, it's unfortunate they got that stigma, you know, and, and maybe they are worse, a little bit worse than others, but they're definitely not the only ones. Uh, the 830s are great drives. This this is an interesting time for SSDs because I think we're right at that cusp where prices are going to fall, and I think they're going to stay there. The last couple of weeks, we've seen many drives under a dollar gigabyte, but you know, you'll come back the next week and they'll be back up to like a dollar twenty five a gigabyte. So it really depends on on what you get that week. And uh, it's kind of a good idea to to maybe um, keep an eye on a lot of those uh, those deals, right? You know, you can set pricing alerts to a lot of these guys. Uh, maybe go to the eight, the Samsung eight thirty, and say, okay, as soon as it drops below, you know, the five hundred gig version drops below five hundred bucks. Let me know those types of things. Um, but yeah, it's we're right on the cusp. I, uh, still, one terabyte drive would be a that's. That's a heck of an upgrade. <laughs> that is a heck of an upgrade. And uh, yeah. lucky, lucky son. I'm going to say it one more time. Um, that's actually going to wrap it for this edition of Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. Again, I'd like to apologize for anybody who missed the show last week. Not because uh, you missed it, but because we didn't make one because we had some traveling problems. That uh, The internet failed us. It did. And we all suffered as a result. Twitch, <laughs> T-W-I-C-H, and twit.tv is the email address. And do us a favor. If you haven't subscribed, go to twit.tv slash twitch and tell your friends. Forward a link to the podcast to them if you got some people out there that are into hardware. And as always, we said it before, we'll say it again. We want your questions. Email them to us, twit, excuse me, twitch, T-W-I-C-H, at twit.tv. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Shroud. Till next time, we'll see you. Well, until... We'll see you on Twitch next week, I promise. <laughs>